Living Hope Assembly of God. Today's message is special to me uh, because it pertains to family. It deals with the family. But not only that, I feel like God, I feel like God gives me every message that I preach. But today I really feel like God has given me uh, this message. But I also feel like uh, God has given me another message uh, that I'm going to preach in the coming weeks. Um, and the name of the message that God gave me for the coming weeks is going to be something like this. Love in the midst of shattered pieces. When I look at my messed up life and where God has brought me from, when I look at life at times now, every single one of us are allowed to be shattered, fragmented, broken. But in the midst of your brokenness, brokenness, God still, still loves you. Amen? Thank God for his grace and mercy. This morning, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, I had a very sore neck the last couple days, and back, neck, whatever you want to call it. It's much better now. Verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is reckless living. But be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, being submissive to one another in the fear of God. Wives, be submissive to your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head and Savior of the church, which is his body. But as the church submits to Christ, so also let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In this way, men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes, nourishes, and cherishes it, just as the Lord cares for the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery but I am speaking about Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, in the name of Jesus, be glorified in this house today. God, speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that something is said, Lord, that will be life-transforming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The spirit-filled life is a life that is filled with potential and power. We need to understand that this morning. The spirit-filled life is a life that is centered solely on Jesus Christ. It is a life that is empowered by the spirit. The spirit-filled life is a life that is shared with others pertaining to Christ, about Christ. The spirit-filled life is a life that is intimate in prayer, intimate in the word of God. The spirit-filled life 
is a life that is possessed by the fruit of the Spirit and a life that is lived out in obedience and trust to God. When we look at what Paul is saying as a whole, in verse 18, Paul began to talk, he first talked about a, he says, don't be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then Paul goes on into detail pertaining to how a wife should carry herself in a marriage and how a husband should carry himself in a marriage. And then you look in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about how children should obey their parents in the Lord. If you want to see a healthy marriage, you got to have a healthy marriage that is founded on Jesus Christ. You want to have a healthy marriage, it has to be one that is dedicated to the things of God. Can I get an amen? amen. You guys, you guys got to say amen. I, I, I want to hear you talk back to me. You know what? The secret is to get pastor to stop talking. If you say amen a number of times, I'll get done really fast. Amen. Let's get it going in. Frank Gabaline, how do you say his name? He, he's written several commentaries, was correct when he wrote, We may take it as a rule of the Christian life that the more we feel that the more we're filled with the Spirit, the more we shall glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. You can tell when someone is, is filled with the Spirit, someone who's excited about the things of God. They have a praise that typically can't be held down. I, I, I struggle when I see that we fail to worship God outwardly. I, I struggle when I see that we fail to worship God individually outside of the building with our entire lives. Listen, it's the, the, the spirit of life is a life that is filled with joy and peace that comes from the spirit. Weariness, fear, doubt, all of those things are normal things it's to the natural man. But the spirit of pure life, we overcome those things because the spirit of God lives inside of us. Somewhere across America, we're preaching and teaching that it's just normal to remain in depression. That it's just normal to remain in anxiety. Can I tell you today that the spirit of God is more powerful than any of those things? Or are we going to struggle? You better believe it. But God has given us his spirit to overcome our struggles. Out of all the things that Paul could have said about the spirit, he said that once a person has the spirit of God inside of them, I want you to notice this. Look with me in the text. He says that they will speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, in their heart to who? To God. So what Paul is saying within our text, he rolls right up to follow me through the text. We're going to go straight. We're going to walk straight through uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18, all the way through verse 33. And so if you'll stay on course, you'll be able to fo follow along with me, and you might be able to say amen when I say, say amen. <laughs> he says that out of the believer, not just inside of the corporate setting, but primarily he's writing to a church. But listen, out of your heart, when your life is at its worst point, there should be a song of praise that should rise up out of you because the Spirit of God that lives within you. Listen, we live in a day and time now, it's so unfortunate that we have more negative things to say than we have positive things to say. I'm getting sick and tired myself of all the negativity that I hear outside of the church. I really am. I'm to a point now, I can care less who's doing what. I'm more concerned about myself and what God is doing in me and what God is doing within this body. This is where I worship. I want to help build you up. I want to help empower you. I want to encourage you. No one has ever been encouraged with negativity. Why in the world if a, negative, if a person who is downcast come to me would I feed them negativity? We want to be able to say, when you are approached by me, I want you to see the love of God shining through me. 
When you come to this church, I want you to see a group of people who radiates with joy. Who radiates with the love of God. You guys are looking at me this morning like, that's an impossibility, preacher. No, it's not. No, it's not. Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, he instructed in verse 8 for the people, instead of uh, think on negative things, he says, think on positive things. Stop thinking on negative things. I know that you have situations we all do in our lives that we're facing hard times, but listen, we need to think about Jesus instead of the hard times. He's going to create a way for you to come out of them. Let me get to when we're filled with the Spirit, there should be a desire to worship God. I said that. And to encourage others in their worship of God. The connection with being filled with the Spirit and praise is greatly significant in the church. It is a mandatory thing. It is a must. We see it so many times in the Psalms. We see it commanding to give God praise, to shout with joy, to show some kind of expression. Don't you know that God knows you're going through something in your life? But God is, God, I promise you, God is more impressed with you giving him praise than he's impressed with you standing with your hands in your pocket. Standing with your hands in your pocket proves nothing. It only proves that your hands are in your pocket. But giving God praise and worship in outward expression shows that you are at least attempting to worship the God of glory. Paul and Silas were thrown into a Roman jail. The Bible says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Who were they singing to? I might not get done with it. Who were they singing to, church? They were singing hymns and praise, giving praise to God. And where were they? Oh, no, they, they were not in jail. They were at home sitting on their sofa. They were in the gathering of the saints. No, they were in jail. They were in solitude away from family and friends. They didn't know their faith, but still they were able to muster up a praise. Some of us are spiritually in, in jail right now. Some of us are in jail because of our health. Some of us are in jail because of our finances. And I want to ch challenge you today. The only way you're going to come out of that thing, you need to come out of that thing giving God some praise. Praise. It's letting me know and probably not, I'm sure let God know that, man, you got faith. You got faith that rises above your circumstance and your situation, I promise you. The opposite proves nothing. And when they were in prison and the other prisoners were listening to them, don't you know when you praise that somebody's listening to you? Don't you know when you, listen, we are, listen, hello, good morning church. We are a spirit-filled church. We have been known throughout history to be expressive. What has happened to the 21st century church? What has happened to us to where we don't want to raise our hands anymore? What has happened to us that we don't want to shout for joy anymore? What has happened to us? I'm not mad, I'm excited. But I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to challenge you today to think about that. What is hindering you from giving God an outward expression of praise? What hinders you from doing something different that you need to be doing in life in the natural? Often because of our lives are so filled with stuff. And we can't lift our hands. We can't lift our hearts. I promise you, if you go all week long never reading your Bible, you might not have a praise inside of you. I promise you, if you go all week long and you don't pray and talk to Jesus, you might not want to give him a praise Sunday morning. 
And I know some are saying right now, well, I don't have to give him praise inside of that building. Listen, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Listen, David wanted to get away from the cares of life. David wanted to find a place that was safe, that he could lift his hands. And when he was sitting next to his wife, when he should have been dignified, David said, watch this for a moment. Why don't you go ahead and hold my staff and hold my crown? I'm going to go ahead and give God an undignified praise. Listen, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what anybody says. When God begins to speak to me and I begin to understand what God has done for me, listen, I'm going to give him a praise. When David and his soldiers came back to Ziklag and the city was burned down and their families were taken from them, David didn't wallow and, and, and moan and groan. Listen, David was at a place where the soldiers were about to kill him. His life was about to be taken from him. And everything that David ever thought was valuable in his life was gone. What did he do next? It's amazing. It's amazing when someone spends time with God, what happens next. The Bible says that when David looked at the situation, he encouraged himself in the Lord. While these boys, Paul and Silas, were in prison, and they began to give God praise, they began to pray and sing him. Prayer is another ingredient. What were they doing in the upper room? I dare to say that they were also singing and praising God, too. But while Paul and Silas were in prison, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake quake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. There's a, there, I want you to understand something, that as they begin to praise God, as they begin to look past their situation and their circumstance, the Bible says that, the earth, that an earthquake came, something like an earthquake came, and the prison doors were open. The miracle is that the chains fell off. So we see within that text, when we begin to praise God, I believe spiritually that when we praise God, I believe that chains begin to fall off. Yes. Somebody was watching. I, I don't think that's by accident they placed that in scripture that, that others were watching and listening, that other prisoners were listening to them. You want to see a generation not praise God, let us continue to not praise him. You want to see a church that rises up that is cold and lethargic? Let us not serve God the way that we should. You want to see a generation not care about coming out to, the, the, to fellowship with others, see the significance of the local church? Stop acting like it's not significant and see what happens to that generation. Are you following me this morning? This is a message, and by the way, the title of the message this morning is, It's Mutual. It's Mutual. And as we walk through the text, we're going to see how mutual it is. Those who are filled with the Spirit will naturally praise God. And not only is it a natural way of, for the believer, those who are filled with the Spirit, to praise God in that way, but praising God is a way that leads to being filled with the Spirit. Are you following me, church? You, I've never met a person. How many of us believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand in this church. I've never met a person that was just baptized in the Holy Spirit without ever entering in. God loves our spontaneous praise and worship of him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but will I pray, and I will also pray with my mind. I will, I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. So 
spontaneous. You don't have to wait to be pumped and primed. <laughs> have you ever just been riding down the street and all of a sudden, I, 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 could, I can remember there are times, I don't do it as often anymore because I have a car filled with family. But there are times where you just, man, especially when I was a single guy, I'd be riding down the road, all of a sudden the worship music, music gets good, and I have to pull over on the shoulder and begin just to cry out to God. Have, have that ever happened to you? It can. It can. Listen, when you're excited about something, when you have seen God move in a, in a way that you know is supernatural and you know it was God, listen, you, you can, it's almost like Nebraska finally scoring a touchdown. You know, it's like, <laughs> like man, you get excited. No, I'm just joking. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Got people leaving and everything. No, actually, I love Nebraska football. I do. I really do. And I like to, I like to have fun with that. Um, I think Nebraska has a great team. They're, doing, they're going to do some great things. Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 95, verses 1 through 2, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Is that an outward expression? Is noise something you can hear? Is it audible? Or is it something that we hold inside of ourselves? Because holding it inside shows how spiritual we really are. Listen, how in the world can we allow an outside influence to, inside, to influence a spirit-filled movement? I don't want to say anything bad about other denominations or what other churches are doing. But how in the world can the outside influence tell a spirit-filled church how they need to worship? How in the world? That is, that is unheard of. That is absurd. It would be like me allowing someone, some other, and I know that we influence each other, but it would be like me allowing someone who lives, uh, another man down the street to come inside of my house and tell me how to raise my children. Are you following me this morning? The list, talk of dealing with praise, the list goes on and on concerning the believer giving praise to God. It's not about us feeling like it, but in spite of how I feel, God is worthy of the praise corporately and privately. This outward expression is not just something that we do in a corporate setting, but it is something that we do in a private setting as well. Doing it in a private setting often makes it easier to do it in a corporate setting. And if we're not doing it in a private setting, more than likely we're not going to do it in a corporate setting. Paul says in verse 20, give thanks. This is Paul. He says, give thanks always. For all things. Paul says that. To God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How often do we give thanks to God in all things? Can, can I ask you that question this morning? How often do we give God praise? How often do we give God thanks in all things? This is a sign of a spirit-filled life. This is a sign of someone who spends time with Jesus and understands where their blessings truly come from. From the time that we're born. And, 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 and have you ever noticed this? I'm just going to go ahead and say it just like this. From the time that you're born, and man, we grow up and we're able to walk and talk. None of us know how to show appreciation for anything. Right? How many babies, how many small children do you know that without being taught, when you place food before them, thank you. Oh, Christmas time. The gifts are open. At least initially, the last thing they say is thank you. Every time a meal is cooked and it's placed on the table to be eaten, 
Am I, am I, am I, am I making sense today? Another danger of not showing appreciation and giving thanks for the effort of another is that our meager attempt of appreciation and thanksgiving will be mechanical and void of true feeling and emotion. Learning how to give thanks and appreciation is something that is taught. It's not something that we're born with because at best we're selfish. At best, we're self-centered. At best, life is all about us. Why? Because we have the, that, that first Adam nature, the sin nature living with inside of us. Until the spirit breaks the back of that nature, we would continue to be self-centered. We would continue to be prideful. We would never consider others above ourselves. Life will always be about us. You know how I know that? I am a father. I love my children. But... Man, for the longest, life was about me. I wouldn't go and do if it didn't satisfy me. I'm learning that life is not about me anymore. But life is about him first. Let me make it spiritual. Life is about him, but life is about them. Raising my kids up, loving my wife the way that she should be loved, steering them in the right direction, Good morning, church. Can I preach to you for a little while on this Sunday morning to family fellowship and getting ready to eat some food? We might as well get stuck with spiritual things before we get stuck with the natural things. Listen, I want to encourage us this morning. This is going to be two weeks in the making, but we're going to make it happen. Amen? In Psalm 15, 23, God charges his people. The one offering, the one who, oh, remember I said I want to go back. Another danger of not showing appreciation and giving thanks for the efforts of another is that our meager attempt of appreciation and thanksgiving will be mechanical and void of true feelings and emotions. Now, when you look at Psalm 50 in verse 23, when you read it, read it in its entirety, but listen to what it says in verse 23. God charges his people the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Israel, if you look at the whole of this psalm, Psalm 50, Israel failed to glorify God. It's all through that psalm. They failed to glorify God. They failed to offer him a praise that was worthy. Psalm 50 and 8, the Lord says to Israel, I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings that are continually before me. Watch this. God was not rebuking them for their external worship. They were not condemned or blamed for their outward performance, but they were blamed and condemned for their inward performance. Are you following me this morning? It, it, it wasn't as a whole, but we're going somewhere with that idea because at the same time, kind of, it was. Instead, the charge, the reproof, relates to other matters, to the want of a proper spirit, to the withholding of the heart in connection with such offerings. Listen, when you are truly spirit-filled and in love with Jesus, Listen, you understand, you're, thank, you're thankful for what he has done. And you're, you're, man, your expression is out of adoration and thanksgiving and his commitment to you more than your commitment to him. Are you following me? Many of us in the church think that God wants our sacrifice. And I want you to hear this. Many of us in the church think that God wants our sacrifice, when in reality, what he really wants is us. Did you get that this morning? See, because if God can get you, that's all that he's really needing. That's all that he's really wanting. Because if he can get you, 
He knows that if he can get you, you'll soon put the stuff down that hinders you from being committed to him. He wants us to be committed to him like he is committed to us. Would somebody, just for the humor of it, would somebody say it's mutual? It's mutual. He wants us to be committed to him just like he is committed to us. God is faithful, amen? God is way more faithful than we could ever be. A sacrifice. What does a sacrifice symbolize? A sacrifice symbolizes someone who completely gives themselves to the Lord. It's not a half-hearted thing, but it is a full commitment. It is a total giving oneself to the Lord. God wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you. If God, it's mutual, church. If God is giving himself 100% to you, should you not give yourself 100% to him? It's a mutual thing. In any relationship, it is mutual. The last thing, and I've learned this the hard way, the last thing that my wife desires is that I treat her one way in a negative way and then go to the store and just buy her some roses and sell them in her hand. I have to learn that the hard way. That don't work. What is she? She's looking for my actions to change more than what I can offer her because God is looking for some kind of expression, church, that proves that you love him. Because if there's no action, there's no faith. James said that. He said, listen, you, you, you do, you, you say with your mouth that, man, I, I want to be paraphrasing, let's feed that person, let's do this, let's do that. He said, your faith is proven by you going and clothe those that you desire, to, that you say you desire to clothe. God is looking for us. We say we love God with our mouths, but oftentimes, guys, our hearts are far from him. Listen, God is love. God is wanting us to reciprocate what he is. It's mutual. Can you tell I'm getting ready to close? I'm at the climax today. Amen. 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 Give me two more and we're out of here. Amen. It's mutual, church. It really is. Next week, we're going to go into a very, very touchy subject. And we're going to deal with husband and wife. And we're going to show how Paul makes it relate to the church. Listen, if we want to be a healthy church, we've got to be a healthy family because the church is made up of families. If the family is unhealthy, the church is unhealthy. And if the family is unhealthy, man, we can't worship God in the way that he deserves to be worshipped. The Bible says that he dances over his people. He rejoices within the midst of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. He's a God that's filled with love. He's a God that's filled with commitment. He's a God that's filled with dedication. Not just on Sunday, but all week long. And so, when we come back next week, we stand up and get ready to sing these songs and worship God in that way. Why don't you love him all week long leading up to it? And I promise you, we might see something called a revival take place in this church. We might see people really getting excited about the things of God. Listen, something is birthing in praise. And something has to die in praise. We have to let some things go as we begin to praise God. 
Amen? Who's coming back next Sunday if the Lord's will? Yeah, look at everybody like, no, I don't know if I want to. <laughs> hey, I promise you, if you go fishing, I'm going fishing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You'll stand this morning. Mm. It's mutual. It really is, guys. I really wanted to preach the entire thing. But I will. So if you really want to hear, well, what is he going to say next week? You got to come back. But I will say this. It's going to be challenging. Isn't it funny that the things that really matter, especially when it pertains to scripture, Often, it's a thing that easily offends. That's weird, isn't it? Why, what is that telling us in that moment? We got issues, and many of us at times are built up in pride. We don't want to hear the truth. We'll run from the truth. We'll hide out. We won't listen. God is wanting to break the back of pride. I promise you, if your marriage, your life is going to be happy or, or at a good place, you've got to break that pride and allow God to release you and let you go. God is doing amazing things. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you're doing a great thing in the midst of us. Lord, today, look within us, God. Look within every single one of us, God. Father, whatever it is, Lord, it's just pride, selfish ambition, whatever it may be. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that you would begin to, to break it off of us. Father, I don't want to be a flaky, shaky pastor. I don't want to lead a flaky, shaky church. God, you know that this message today about giving you praise. This is about you, Jesus. This is not about a show. This is not about us acting foolish. But this is about us giving you praise because you're worthy. I pray today, Jesus, that every single one of us, God, under the sound of my voice, that once we get ready to leave this place, God, and as we go and do the rest of our week, Father, I pray that we would stop and reflect on your goodness and give you the praise and the honor and the glory that is due to you. Strengthen the hearts of your people, God. Remove the mountains and the obstacles, God. But if you're not going to move them, give us the strength to climb. And Father, once we reach the top, we will shout with the voice of triumph. We will shout with the voice of victory. Father, be glorified in your people. Living Hope Assembly of God 